Well, it's good to finally see. It's good to finally see you. And that may sound a bit strange, because for some of us, it's the first time that we've actually laid eyes on each other. But I say it's good to finally see you for two reasons. Whenever we have the opportunity to stand before a group of leaders, we look every single person in the eyes. Now, it gets a lot more uncomfortable if there's 500 people in the room. <laughs> but we look every person in the eye and we say, it is good to see you. It's not just good to see you, it is good to finally see you. And the reason why we say finally is because we received this invitation almost two years ago. And Brother Earl, when we receive invitations, we begin not only imagining what might be created when this group of leaders gets into this room together. We not only imagine, we envision the possibilities and the relationships that will be formed. But not only that, we have been praying for you for nearly two years. So it's good to finally see your face, Steve. But the other reason why we say it's good to finally see is because we know full well the heartache, the pain, the trauma of being unseen, of being unheard, of being unacknowledged. So tonight, we're going to invite you into a space of fearless dialogue. And what we seek to do is to create unique spaces for unlikely partners, folks who don't normally sit together in a circle, to engage in hard, heartfelt conversations about taboo subjects. And tonight, what we are going to reflect on is how we might see those that are around us that otherwise might be overlooked. How we might enhance our vision to see those who may be invisible. But in order to do that, we'd like to invite you all into a laboratory. Right? And so this looks like an ordinary, but well, it's not an ordinary because it ain't white and only on the floor. This does not look like an ordinary fellowship hall. Right? Uh, I would not like for you all to think about this as a fellowship hall or a worship center. This is a laboratory. And like any good laboratory, my brother, sometimes some things have to blow up <laughs> or break down in order to get to a breakthrough. And so tonight we're going to ask that you not only think with this, but you think with this and this. Everybody raise your right hand in the air, please. Your right hand. Now, we're going to invite you to put your hand on your belly. Don't put it on nobody else's belly. <laughs> put your right hand on your belly. Everybody, please. Your right hand on your belly. Everybody got your hand on your belly. Now, uh, my, 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 uh, my grandma, she had an eighth grade education, but she was one of the wisest people that I ever met. She was from uh, Cotton Fields, Mississippi. Y'all notice I didn't say Mississippi, I said Mississippi, right? And my grandma did not study ancient theology. So she did not know that in the Enlightenment that people believed that the soul was located in the brain. She didn't study post-Enlightenment thinkers that might say that the soul would be located in the heart somewhere. But no, my, my grandma had some down-home mother with wisdom. And so grandma would walk into a room and she'd be like this. Andre, oh, something feel right in here. And then she walked right back out the room. Right? My grandmother, like the ancient rabbinic Jews, understood that the soul is located in your gut. Everybody put your hand on your gut. We're going to wake up our soul right now. Everybody, right hand in the air. Put it on your gut. So everybody take a deep breath. Oh, that was so weak. I know it's the end of the day, 
right? Let's try it again. Deep breath. Ooh. <laughs> Let's wake her up. Let's wake him up. All right, one more time. Ooh. <laughs> I felt better, right? So now, now that your soul is awake, we're going to ask that you not settle with what first comes here, but you learn from what is coming from here. Uh, I'm going to share one more story, and, and, then, uh, and then we'll talk, because if I talk the entire time, it's aspirin. That's a fearless monologue. Right? <laughs> so we, we're here to have a dialogue. But let me tell one more story. So I was in um, this church in South Georgia. And I, I was uh, sitting on the back row. And there was this older woman. And she just stared at me. <laughs> it was so uncomfortable. I was like, what, what is going on? And she just kept staring at me. Not saying anything. The church service was going on. <laughs> And then she leaned over to me and she said, Baby, if you don't want to get old, die young. And then, and then she, she turned around and then she started staring at me. And it was really uncomfortable this time. And then she said, One more thing. Yes, ma'am. The longest journey you will face in life is the trip from your head to your heart. And then she got up and walked out of the church. I was like, this is the strangest sermon I've ever heard. <laughs> right? But we're asking now that you take the long journey from your head to your heart to your gut. Since this is a laboratory, we'll begin with our first experiment. Angie, you got it. All right. From your head to your heart, yes? When we talk about hearing, what do we hear from each other? So what we're gonna do is an experiment called Cut Dead. Cut Dead. This comes from a 19th century philosopher and psychologist, William James. I'm gonna need a volunteer, so I'm taking a little bit of time so someone to get their courage up. To work with me. So I don't have to pick somebody, because I will, right? No, we don't have a volunteer. So what William James said was that all human beings have a fundamental desire to be seen and be perceived as favorable to other people. Basically, it means we care what other people think. And we want people to see us. So we do things to please other people. And this shared desire is acknowledged and confronted by a shared experience of being cut dead. So I'm going to ask for my volunteer on your paper, everybody should have a paper, and their seat. There's a quote by William James under number three, acknowledge, unacknowledge all around us. You see that quote? Who's my volunteer? We just need one reader. Just, just, uh -huh. Oh, I saw a hand. Yeah, I saw two hands. But I saw this hand first. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Stand up. Okay. So, give me your name. Parker, good to see you. So, I want you to read this quote. But I need you to really read it so that the people feel it in their good and with their heart. So we need you to channel your inner Broadway part. Yeah, come on, Parker. Oh, yes, and you have the mic. There we go. Yes, you ready? You ready? Go no ahead. more fiendish punishment could be devised were such a thing physically possible that one should be turned loose in society and remain absolutely unnoticed by all members thereof. If not one turned around when we entered, answered when we spoke, or minded what we did, but if every person we met cut us dead yeah. and acted as if we were non-existent things, the kind of rage and the kind of rage and impotent despair would long before well up in us, from which the cruelest bodily torture would be a relief. Yeah. Thank you. I'm 
I'm going to read it again so you just hear it in a different voice. Okay? No more fiendish punishment could be devised for such a thing physically possible that one should be turned loose into society and remain absolutely unnoticed by all members thereof. If no one turned around when we entered, answered when we spoke, or minded what we did. But if every person we met cut us dead, us dead. and acted as if we were non-existent things, things, not humans, things, a kind of rage, an impotent despair, there will before long well up in us and from which the cruelest bodily torture would be a relief. I'm going to ask you to get in groups of two or three. Some of your groups have more than two or three people to break off. But take a moment before you do that. And think, not with your head, but with your, but your heart, what you just heard. And then it was the two or three. I want to think about, feel, excuse me, feel. Tell what it was like to feel if you've ever been cut dead. Not as much as Groups of two. Cut dead. Or three. Not groups of four or five. Groups of two and three. So if you're group of six, please. Two or three. Let's talk. Let's talk. How does it feel? How does it feel? Have you walked into a room and nobody turns around and you it? How does it feel? Come on, let's talk. Let's talk. Let's talk. Let's talk. How does it feel? Have you have you been into a place where people see you but they don't see you? I've been there. Groups of two or three. How does it feel? What is it? What, what is this rage? Have you felt this rage? Have you felt that despair? How does it feel? What does it mean to be cut down? Have you felt that? What does it feel like? When somebody says something to you and they don't mind what you say. Some words. How did you feel? One word. I 
right here. Right here. Invisible. Invisible. Empty. The mean. The mean. Shame. I heard what neglected. Non existent. Disappointed. Disappointed. Tell, tell me more. Disappointed. Who said disappointed? What's your name, sir? Chris. Chris. Tell me more. Disappointed because the particular instance that I thought of, when I walked into the space, I thought we were colleagues. So to walk in a space where you anticipated being accepted and then to be totally ignored, the initial response was disappointment. But then it evolved into rage. Ah. Wow. So the disappointment led to rage. A big, ah. So these were your colleagues. These were people that you thought were going to embrace you. Right. All right. Thank you, Chris. Okay. So back into your room. No, no, no. Oh, more. Oh, more. 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 Come on. What else? Ignore. Ignore. Scared. Scared. Worthless. Lonely. Worthless. Why worthless, my brother? Anxious. Hold on a second. Why worthless? I say worthless because it's almost like a, a cut at your self esteem. Like, you know, not, you know, worthy of your presence or my ideas, not worthy of, you know, about being utilized in your organization. Thank you, Jenny. Jeff, thank you, Jenny. Others? Overlooked. Overlooked. And saw. Exhausted. I would like to hear more about that. Why exhausted? And your name? Oh, you said it for her? <laughs> <laughs> well, what is your name? Christina. Why exhausted? So, Ms. Monica said that she saw the true character when the crisis unfolded. Let me share a little bit about this, and then we're going to move to our next, our next experiment. So, uh, it, it, it's strange that William James wrote these words in 1890, and they still feel very real to us today. But some of you all have heard of William James. I know he, he, made, he was a famous psychologist and pragmatist from from Harvard, he wrote this 600-page book called The Principles of Psychology. And what he was basically saying is that human beings are social selves and that they have this innate need to be in relationship with, with others. But something happens when we are stripped of that, 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 that need to, to be in relationship. He calls it cut dead. So when we're working in urban neighborhoods, down in urban Right? We're working in urban neighborhoods, I often say William James was a thug. <laughs> right? Because in this very academic 600 page text, he uses a slang term. Cut dead was a 19th century slang term that meant to be snubbed completely or deliberately ignored. What does it mean for someone to deliberately, they know you're sitting here, and they ignore you anyway? 
And so I, I was a student at Princeton, uh, and I, I was working on my doctoral, my doctoral, uh, my dissertation. And so I would be sitting in my uh, carol, just typing away, and then all of a sudden, it's just right, right. Rodriguez, I'm sorry. Rodriguez. So all of a sudden, Rodriguez, I get these knocks on my door. It'd be around lunchtime. And I don't know if they were passing out flyers or what. So I, I'd be typing, and I get these knocks around noon, Rodriguez. And then, you know, there'd be students from around campus, and they, they found out that there was this brother who was doing his PhD in counseling. And if they bought him a hamburger, he could give free counseling. So, you know, so you know, around lunchtime, these cats would start knocking. And so I started hearing the stories of these students. And then uh, in the evenings, I left Princeton and I went to Newark. Anybody been to Newark? Newark ain't Princeton. I promise you. I promise you it's not Princeton. So, you know, in Newark, I would work with young men who were coming out of prison. And the thing that was striking to me, Brother Sprinkle, was that the young men in Newark were saying the same thing as the young men in Princeton. That they felt like they were unseen and unheard. And when they felt like their sense of self was not recognized, something in their identity began to crumble. It not only affected their self, it affected how they interacted with the people around them and how they envisioned a new future for their lives. And so I started thinking about what does it mean to be cut dead, but still have hopes and dreams for your life and still be alive. And so it was interesting. This book came out about six weeks before the Zimmerman birth. And so I'm a young black professor at uh, a university, and I just wrote a book about young black men who feel invisible. And so now I'm a national expert, right? And so I'm, I'm being invited onto these, these uh, college campuses. I'm being invited to, to, uh, to, to, to go and do radio interviews. And I went to this one college campus in rural Kansas. Yeah, you said, mm -mm. now it's not Newark, <laughs> you're right about it. So I, this, this, I went to rural Kansas to talk about young black men. Do y'all see the humor in that? Ain't no young black men in rural Kansas. And so I go and I'm invited to speak at this college, it gets even crazier, to give a lecture on a Friday night. Now y'all came out on a Tuesday night Students don't go to lectures, generally, on Tuesday afternoons. But they certainly not going to go to a lecture on a Friday night. So I'm doing a lecture in rural Kansas on a Friday night about young black men who feel muted and invisible. And Brother Wells, I walk into the auditorium and it's full of white senior citizens. Yeah, it's, it's even funny. Because there was a senior citizen's home right next to the college. But as we started talking about what it feels like to be invisible, to be cut dead, they said it feels hurt, I, it, it, I feel empty, I feel demeaned, I feel neglected, I feel shamed. The same things that these young brothers were saying, they were saying. And I began to, to theorize that this is a human problem and not just one. Well, I do think young black men and young girls are, are still highly susceptible to being cut there, but this is a problem that we all face. And so what we're now going to do is to stretch ourselves. Because what we're trying to do is to not only feel what it must be like as an invisible person, we're not just thinking about that theoretically. We want to ground ourselves in it. So we need one more reader. Experiment two. Jeff. Okay? So Jeff. Um, thank you, Parker. So Jeff, we want you to read with gusto. Right? You're going to win a Grammy and an Oscar. 
from this reading. Uh, We're so in the Tony, right? Yes, sir. You get the triple crown, all right? Yes, so, Jeff, we want you to read this piece by Kipling Williams. But as you read it, we're going to ask that everybody put your paper on the ground. Now, this is called a call to remember. Remember me. So we're asking you to remember a moment. We're not going to think about this theoretically. We want you to remember this instance in your life. So you may want to close your eyes to remember that moment. You may want to look off into the ceiling. You may want to look down. But however you need to, I want you to not imagine this, but to remember. You ready, Jeff? Yes, sir. So I'm going to follow right behind you, and I'm going to echo some of the things. So, but, so I'm going to ask that you read it slowly and methodically. All right. You got it. Few moments in life are more painful than feeling that others, especially those whom we admire and care about, want nothing to do with us. Nothing to do with us. There may be no better way to communicate this than for others to treat you as though you are invisible. Invisible. Like you didn't exist. You don't exist. Maybe at first glance, this doesn't seem as intolerable as I suggest. But recall for a moment recall. a situation in which your friends, your friends, family, family, co-workers, co-workers, or relationship partners acted as though you did not exist. You don't exist. Remember the feeling. Remember. As though you were invisible. Invisible. Yet you could see the others going about their lives as though nothing unusual was happening. I know y'all see me. What did you do? What did you do? Did you try talking to them? Hey, I'm right here. To find out what's going on? Hey, man, what's going on? But what if they didn't talk back? Hey, man, come on now. But instead acted as though they had not heard you. I know you heard me. Maybe you waved your hands in front of them. You see me? I'm right here. If you did, what did it feel like when they even refused to make eye contact with you? Hey, I'm your boy. Were you able to carry on as though everything was normal? I'm cool. I'm cool. Did you start to withdraw? Or did you reciprocate their actions? If you don't see me, I don't see you. Did you disengage? Wondering if you really belong with these people after all. Call in which your friends, these are your friends, your family members, your co workers, your relationship partners acted as though you did not exist. Remember feeling as though you were invisible, yet you can see the others going about their lives as though nothing unusual was happening. What did you do? Did you try talking to them to find out what, what's going on? But, but what if they didn't talk back? But instead acting as though they had not heard you in the first place. Maybe you waved your hand in front of their faces. And if you did, what did it feel like when they still refused to make eye contact with you? Were you able to carry on as though everything was normal? Did you start to withdraw? Or did you reciprocate their action? You don't see me, I ain't gonna see you. Did you disengage? Wondering if you really belong with these people after all. Sit with me. Sister Angie and I are going to give you a few instructions.
Remember me. Keep talking. How does it feel? This is your friends, your family, your co workers. They act as though you do not exist. How does it feel? How did it feel? This is a call to remember. We're not asking you to imagine. What did you do? Did you did you wave your hand in front of their faces? Did you did you disengage one friend? Do I really belong to this bathroom? What did you do? How did it feel? How did it feel? Let's think about that. These these are people that say they care about you. We got 40 seconds. How does it feel? 40 seconds. I'm not asking you to imagine. Some married people in the room. Y'all know what this island they feel like. Yeah. 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 Y'all have been there. You weren't always the cool kid. In sixth grade, they all had a tank for They left you out. You remember that. It happened in grad school, too. Yeah, I mean, this, it happens in the courtroom. Come on. It happens in the church house. You all know what it feels like. Come on. 15 seconds. 15 seconds. 15 seconds. Uh, it's starting. We got a bonus 30 seconds. How does it feel? How does it feel? How does it feel? Stephanie, if we put an emotion 
unrestrained. How did strange feel? Mad. Mad. Okay, she get pissed off. Let's be real. Okay. How did it feel? Like, oh man, what's up? Man? Good to see you. How did it feel? <laughs> okay, so so he disengaged. Eric disengaged. So let's put it. Let's put a a, a, a feeling tone on. No. No. Thank you. How did it feel? Disconnected. Disconnected. Initially isolated. Initially isolated, and then. And then I just found another point to connect. Okay. So initially <laughs> isolated, and then I found a point to connect with. So the disconnected and the isolated found community. Your name? Verlinda and Kenny. All right, others, how did it feel? Unwanted. unwanted. Let's put it emotional, unwanted. What's underneath that? Hurt, hurt. Give me your name? Caroline. Carol? Okay. Carol, okay. Others, how did it feel? It's sort of actually visible in the sense that you stick out. So I that feels vulnerable to me. Vulnerable? Thank you, Lucy. Level of uh, insufficiency. Insufficiency. Okay, let's put it. That's that's a real good word. But let's put an emotion underneath. Probably worthless. Worthless. All right. Thank you all. We're gonna come back to this group in a minute. Okay. Now the groups that got left out. How did you all feel? Y'all stand. The groups that got left out. How did how did you all feel? Left out. <laughs> Okay. So, so you all started in some ways beginning to find community. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Anxiety. Okay. Over here. Beneath. Beneath. Say more. Just didn't measure up. We don't measure up. Yeah. Give me your name. Herbert. Thank you, brother Herbert. Up. Lonely. Your name? Ashley. Ashley and yours, man. <laughs> Stephanie. Okay. How did it feel? Christine? Overlooked. Overlooked. Same thing. Forgotten. This group has less worth than the other group's name. So that word worthless came up again. Thank you. No? What would you say? Um, Our nurse is going to heal us. I stand correct. <laughs> you know, honestly, I knew that it was an extra piece. I'm here to know. Yes. So, because you all were selecting others in terms of the group, I looked at it as the exercise of the group itself. Mm -hmm. Then, when my the president, Susan, mentioned about, what are you talking about? Then I thought about it. Other than that, it was really the Okay. So, yeah. you, you were kind of known to it like Eric. Yeah, I was kind of like, oh, okay. Okay. Here, how did it feel for you all? You did Oh, so there's a lot of detachment in this room. <laughs> right. I don't care. So, so you were you were happy to be with your group. At least you weren't alone like them. Okay. So So something happened. Excuse me. Something happened here. I know your name starts with a D. Daryl. So Daryl was sit can you go over where you were, Daryl? No, 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 not yet, not yet, no, 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 we ain't sending you to your retro home, right? Daryl stood up and looked around the room and said, I ain't staying here by myself. No <laughs> and so you came over to Miss Stephanie, right? All right, so what, what did you do when you came to Miss Stephanie? I introduced myself, and I said, you don't have to be alone. I got you. Okay, and then Lucy was sitting over here. And she saw community forming. And what did you decide? She was trying to infiltrate. <laughs> okay. So Lucy came to offer support. All right. If you all can please take a seat. We're going to break this down in just a minute. For those of you all who were on the side in which you isolated the other folks. Now this is a social experiment. We're not trying to point the finger at you in, in, in any bad way. How did it feel to move away from them? 
and to leave them out. Oh, yeah, she, her hand came up like she's the star student in class. Yes, ma'am. I, I was angry because that's my friend. Mm -hmm. And I don't want my friend to isolate. Okay. So I was kind of, I, I knew some social experience, but I was still wanting him to be here. So I was kind of like talking so we could hear. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So you you were angry. Yes. Okay. Give me your name one more time. Miss Mom. Others. Yes. Park. Oh, manipulate. Manipulate. Oh. Let's put a let's put a, a a feeling word under manipulation. Angry. So you pissed off too. Okay. Others. Bad. It made you feel bad. Guilty. Okay. She didn't want to. Virginia. Okay, so there's some guilt there. Others, we'll take a few more. Yes. You felt like you were belittling her. Okay, your name? Thank you, Caprice. And? Concern. Concern. Say more. Because I wasn't sure if he needed to share and mm -hmm. what, it would make, what it made him feel like to be the guy who was left out. Okay, and your name? Donna. Donna. So Donna felt some concern. Empathy, right? Yeah, others. Sympathy? Yes. I felt violated. Violated. So as one who was not seeing Tisdale, you felt violated. Yeah, that she asked me to do something that I wouldn't normally do. Oh, now. Okay. So the power of peer pressure, right? She asked me to do something that I would normally do, but in this space, I did Now, let's think about this beyond this space. Have any of us ever isolated someone else? And we knew in our heart of hearts, this ain't me. I did it anyway. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Incomplete. The group felt incomplete because he wasn't there. How did that make you feel? That was not me. Yeah, so it's the same thing, right? You, you felt incomplete, and you felt like you were belittling him. Tisdale, you had one, something else to say? No, 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 I'm just like, thank you all. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. So let's, let's, pull this, let's pull these strings together for a little bit. So Kipling Williams is a social psychologist, and for 40 years, he studied social ostracism. For, for nearly four decades, he looked at a group of people who felt like they were unseen and unheard, and he studied how does this affect their sense of being in the world. There was one woman who had received the silent treatment from her husband for over three decades. And in an age of Me Too, right, where we know about the power and the pernicious evil of abuse, she said, I would have rather he hit me because at least I would have known I was alive in his eyes. There was another young girl that he studied. She was a high school student, and she went into the school, and her colleagues, her classmates decided she's not going to be in the inquiry. And so they chose not to to see her for weeks. They didn't speak to this young girl for weeks. And her brother found her on the floor, having swallowed 29 Valium pills. They rushed her to the hospital. They were able to revive her. She went back to school. They embraced her. We're so glad you're OK. And then weeks later, they ostracized her again. What Kipling Williams says is that there are four fundamental human needs that every single person desires. They are fundamental to our living. And as I understand Williams, when these fundamental human needs begin to crumble, so does your identity. And some of them are on this board. 
The first fundamental human need that William says, we all have a need to belong. Right? Y'all watch National Geographic Earth. Right? You watch National Geographic, so you see that, that gazelle running along. Y'all know that gazelle on National Geographic. This is how gazelles run. Right? <laughs> and then all of a sudden, the gazelle is running. He's looking around. Where everybody go? Right? And the gazelle is just sitting there looking like, man, this is going to be a long day and a very short life. Right? <laughs> Even in nature. We see that to be in a community provides security and worth. And to be disconnected from community, you become isolated and vulnerable. Right? And so the first fundamental human need is belonging. How do we create communities that welcome people into spaces such that they feel like they are wanted there? How do we create schools? How do we create churches? How do we create nonprofits that say, we are glad you're here. It's good to see you. The second fundamental human need is a sense of self-esteem. Now, you all said that you felt isolated and vulnerable, and that caused your that that, that caused you to feel like you did not belong. Right? But somebody said they felt worthless. Somebody said they felt forgotten. Somebody said they felt angry. And the reason why you begin feeling these things is because this internal conversation starts to happen. What did I do to get excluded? Maybe I dressed the wrong way. Maybe I said the wrong thing at the dinner table. Maybe, maybe I believe the wrong things. Maybe my skin is a little different. Maybe I'm in the wrong zip code. I don't know. And these questions start beating away at the self. And your self-esteem begins to crumble because you don't belong. Right? And does this make any sense, y'all? So not after, after the belonging begins to erode. This is like Dante's rungs of hell. And then, and then the self-esteem begins to dissipate. And then after that, you begin to wonder, do I control the environments in which I move, right? So there is something to be said when you walk into a room, somebody acknowledges you. But what happens when you walk into a room and everybody turns their back? Maybe because you got a felony. Maybe because you didn't graduate from the right school. Maybe because you, you believe differently or you love differently. So when you walk into a room, you can't control the environment, but what you can control is you can hit them, you can hit them, and then they see you. That's what happened in Newark. You don't see me? <laughs> Just wait. You about to see me now. Belonging. Self-esteem. Control. And then... And all of that begins to fall apart. You begin to question your meaningful existence. If I weren't here, would anybody care? If I died today, would anybody notice? If I didn't show up for work, would anybody call and check on me? Right? Because you don't belong. You're questioning yourself. You can't control the environment. And so you move out of the environment and you wonder, will anybody even care? These are cycles of death. And as community leaders, our challenge is, how can we create spaces there where people feel like they belong? When you all walk into this space, we greeted you in a very standard way. It's good to see you. Welcome to Fearless Dialogues. Are you ready to change? Ask me if you can stand up real quick. So, we had an opportunity. You come over and ask me. We had an opportunity to do some work at Yale. And uh, we were at Yale Divinity School, and 400 black and brown people showed up for uh, a Fearless Dialogue. And they were like, oh, sh we in church. Uh, they was like, we ain't seen this many black folks on Yale's campus. And so 
the people are gathering and there's this prison choir. This prison choir that comes because they come to these kind of community events and they do the clothes and songs. And so there's this brother who walks up and I'm greeting everybody at the door like you all were greeted by our friends. And I said, hey man, I'm not going to shake your hand because I'm jerks. I have to say, hey, it's good to see you. Welcome to Fearless Dialogue. Are you ready to change? He looked at me like, this is strange. And then he walked off. And then I continued greeting people. And just minutes before we started, the brother came back to me and he said, Hey man, I don't know what you're here to do. But I just want to say that when you came up to me and you said, It's good to see you, and you looked me in my eye, you're the first person in over five months that's looked me in the eye. And whatever you say, once you go in that room, it don't matter. What I got, I got enough. We've done this with over 50,000 people. And four times when we've asked, how does it feel to be cut dead? People have said, I feel suicidal. Now, I felt suicidal. Now, I would feel suicidal. How does it feel to be cut dead? I feel suicidal. This is life or death work. To see the people who are around us, you never know how close somebody is. So now we're going to do one final experiment. Jeff, you got something? No. Okay, I thought you Okay. So now we're going to ask that you would pair up in groups of two. Everybody in groups of two. We're going to be out here at 9 o'clock, I promise you. Groups of two. Everybody, groups of two. 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 Yeah. So we're going to ask that you face your partner. And that we want you to face your partner square. You can't look over your shoulder. We want you to look directly at your partner. Chris, you need a partner? Anybody need a partner? Anybody need a partner? Anybody need a partner? Okay, Chris, she needs a partner over here. Chris, she needs a partner. Right there. Yeah. Face each other. Okay, so now we're going to ask, we're almost done, you all. But now we're going to ask that you put everything on the floor, that there's nothing in your hand or in your lap. And you should be seated squarely in front of your partner at a comfortable distance, right? Turn your chair just a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> she said his mom was out of space. Okay, at a comfortable distance. Right? So now, we have talked about what it feels like to be invisible. What it feels like to be cut dead. You all have stated what it felt like. Right? You've also stated what it felt like when your friends, your family members, your co-workers acted as though you did not exist. I did not say this. The work of Fearless Dialogues is built upon three pillars. See, hear, change. It's good to see you. Welcome to Fearless Dialogues. Here, are you ready for change? Change. See, hear, change. Our belief is that if you cannot see the person, and we are people of faith, if you cannot see the people around you as whole human beings made in the image of God, anything that they say, you cannot hear them fully. And if you cannot hear the people nor see them as whole human beings, any change that is created is not sustainable. So how do we see? That's the first thing. Tomorrow we'll work on hear and change. This is a seeing exercise. We call this exercise, no, before I give the name, please introduce yourself, share your name, and then I'm going to ask that you designate one person as a person A, and somebody as a person B. Who's person A, who's person B? Share your name. Okay? All right? So introductions are done. Okay, everybody? Now? Everybody, let's clap, let's clap, let's clap, let's clap. Let's clap. We call this Fearless Dive.
dialogue. Less is not a suffix, meaning without. It's impossible to have a hard conversation with a stranger without fear. But if we look at it as a compound word, doorknob, right? My kids love compound words. Stop sign, trash can, right? Compound words. If we look at fear less as a compound word, it is possible for us to engage in hard conversations with less fear. So now I'm going to ask you to move into this experiment with less fear. We got 17 minutes. We're going to do it. Okay. This is called, y'all ready? The long loving look at the real. The long loving look at the real. Now, this experiment was developed by a monk by the name of William McNamara, and he believed that if you look deeply enough into the eyes of another, you can come up and see yourself. The eyes are a gateway to the soul. And this experiment is not long in duration, because we're going to be out of here by 9 o'clock. But we're asking that it be unhurried. We live in a life where we move at such a hairy pace. What does it mean to behold something? To fully witness it. To live into an encounter. It's not going to be a long duration of time. It's only 90 seconds. But we want it to be unhurried. This is a long, loving look. We stare at things that confuse us or appall us. We're not asking that you think about love in an eros, mushy kind of way. We're thinking about that you would offer a loving look, a non-judgmental look, not a gaze, not a stare, not that game you played when you were in fourth grade and your eyes start watering because you try and not blink. We're not talking about that kind of look. We're talking about a long, loving look. And then finally, the person that's in front of you is a real human being. Right? It's the end of the day. That lipstick probably worn off by now. <laughs> Right? It's the end of the day. Somebody, they might have shaved and they, they missed the spot this morning and now it looked like a patch. I, you know, it's a real person in front of you. And in the words of, of Thomas Calloway, the great philosopher, also known as CeeLo Green, the person in front of you is perfectly imperfect. And so now, we're going to invite you to do this long, loving look at the real, and this is how we will do it. We're going to ask that you would face your partner, and that you, person A, in a minute you'll ask for permission of person B to look lovingly at them. Now, we want this to be a safe experiment, so we're going to ask that your loving looks be kept above the shoulder. Everybody, our loving looks will be above the shoulder. Now, this is a, a silent experiment. It's, it's meant to be done without talking. It's a contemplative experiment. But sometimes in these moments, people may give it. Because we know that laughter at times can take us to a deeper and more meaningful place. And finally, we recognize that this may be challenging for some of you. And before you say, I can't do it, I want you to reflect on the fact that we have done this experiment in prisons with gang leaders who hate each other. And then they're seated in front of each other having a long, loving look at the real. I'm not sure if there are gang leaders in the room. I hope not. But it's possible. I, you know, I, I love my people. Right? But we're going to invite you to please try and fear this. So now, if you are able, 
to give it a shot. This particular experience transformed lives. We're going to invite person A to please ask permission of person B. May I please look at you, love? Please ask permission now. <laughs> Permission granted? Okay. All right, we will begin in three, two, one. Let us begin. Okay, time, everybody, time. Right hand in the air, right hand in the air. Now you really don't want to do it. Put your hand on your belly. All right, deep breath. Oh. Sounded different, didn't it? Okay, now, person A, please thank person B. Okay, now, person B, please ask permission of person A. May I look at you loving? Now, now it's important, person A, that you receive the loving look. How often do leaders give and give and give and give, but they cannot receive gifts that replenish them? Person B, would you please ask person A, may I please look at you, love? <laughs> Permission granted? We will begin in three, two, one. Right, right hand in the air, right hand in the air, on your belly. Okay, deep breath. Whoa, <laughs> Whoa yeah. <laughs> All right, person B, please thank person A. Now, I have two questions for you, and we're only going to have 90 seconds to go through these questions. We're going to do it quickly. The first question is, how did it feel? How did it feel? How did it feel? How did it feel? The second question is a strange one. Who did you see? How did it feel? Who did you see? How did it feel? Who did you see? Let's talk. Let's talk. How did it feel? Who did you see? Let's talk. Talk with your partner. With your partner. With your partner. How did it feel? Who did you see? 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 How did it feel? How did it feel? How did it feel? Let's think about the emotion. How did it feel? 45 seconds, everybody. 45 seconds. Who did you see? 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 Who? Who did you see? The big thing that I saw. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Everybody, let's clap, let's clap, let's clap.
did it feel? Let's call them out. Warm. Warm. Silly. <laughs> Free. Uncomfortable. Uncomfortable. I'm glad we got it out there. Uncomfortable, and you say awkward, right? Uncomfortable and awkward. Yeah, okay. Serious? Others. Mysterious. 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 Say it again. Mysterious. It was a little weird. Yes. How, how did it feel? Natural. 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 Say it again. Pure. Pure. No, no. Secure. Secure. Thank you. Stop. Others. Pleasant. Pleasant. Uh, a little uneasy. Yeah. Others. Love Great. Love it. Come on. Any, any more? Engaging. Engaging. Trusting. Familiar. Trusting. Familiar. Unself conscious. Say, say it again. Unself conscious. Unsettling. Self conscious. Others. Yes. Okay, so that, give me your name one more time. Kenya. Kenya says she felt peace when she was looking at someone. When they were looking at her, it felt nervous. Right? Why is that? I think that's, it, you know, we, we've done, I, I, I was sharing with uh, Courtney in the back that we've done this work in, in, in Ferguson. And the folks in Ferguson, when we did that Remember Me and we left folks out, they walked around the room and found the people who were left out, and they formed their own group, right? They're organizers at their core, but they said the exact same thing that Kenya said, that they felt some kind of peace when they were looking at other people, but they felt anxiety and discomfort when folks were looking at them. That is a recipe for justice fatigue and burnout. When you can give and give and self-empty yourself when you do not have the ability to receive the love of another. Who did you see? Who did you see? Who did you see? I saw me. I saw myself, right? Who did you see? A child of God. Who did you see? I saw my daughter. Others. Passion. I saw passion. Uh, my, grandmother. my grandmother. Who did you see? I saw my son. I saw my son. If, yeah, who, who did you see? Come on. A couple more. Who did you see? A friend. A friend. Three more. Judge was or what, but I saw a lion. I saw that sounds weird. A lion. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Parker saw, saw a lion. Right? But in, in, if, if we think about it as an archetype and a metaphor, a lion is a very powerful being. Others, who else did you see? My sister. My sister. Now, I need three volunteers. Just three volunteers. Three volunteers. Can you come on up, please? I need two more. Two more. Come on, Jeff. So I want you all to see where we have come. We'll figure that out. We only got four minutes. All right. I want you all to see where we have come. When we entered into this room, we talked about what it felt like to be cut dead. You all said it made me feel hurt and invisible to, to walk into a room and nobody minds what you do. You feel empty and you feel demeaned and neglected. There's a shame in being non-existent. And that disappointed trend furred into rage and I felt unsafe and excluded and I felt cut off and I felt overlooked and exhausted and it, it poured out everything in me and it made me feel worthless. That's what it felt like to be cut dead. But then when you remember a time when your friends, your family members, your co-workers acted as though you did not exist, it made you feel numb in that moment. Because you were invisible and that strangeness transferred not only into rage, but I was mad because I was disconnected and, and isolated and vulnerable. It made me question my worth and anxiety peaked because I felt overlooked and forgotten and detached and I felt manipulated. It made me feel guilt. I felt belittled. I wanted to empathize, but I felt violated. That is what it felt like. When your friends, your family members, your co-workers made you feel invisible. You will 
know what it feels like to be cut dead, to be unseen, to be, to be unheard, but when you took 42 seconds, it was 90 seconds, when you took 42 seconds to see a stranger in front of you, initially it felt a little silly and uncomfortable and awkward, but after that weirdness died off, you felt a warmness and you saw the mystery in the person in before you, you felt natural, it felt pleasant. Somebody said it felt great and they, they felt love and it was engaging. It was familiar. And while it was a little unsettling, I saw peace in their eyes. I saw a lion. I not only saw a lion, when I looked into the eyes of a stranger, I saw myself. In 42 seconds, I saw a child of God. I saw my own daughter. I saw my grandmother. I saw my son. I saw a friend. I saw a gentle giant. In 42 seconds, what would our communities look like? If we live our lives in 42 second intervals, what would our churches look like? What would our schools look like? What would our government look like? If we took the time to see the people that cross within our community, one challenge for you. And we'll continue tomorrow if you can join me. For the next three days, I challenge you to see three people. There are going to be some measuring tapes as you walk out of this room. They're three feet long. We invite you to see three people that cross within your three feet because you know what it feels like to be invisible. And you know the power of 42 seconds. And the checkout line, hang up your telephone and look him in the eye and say, how you doing, James? And notice James will turn his head to the side. And sometimes James will say back to you, I've been standing here for five hours and nobody's looked me in the eye and called me by name. 42 seconds can keep somebody off of that edge. It's 9 o'clock. We're grateful that you all invited us to dinner. If you have time, be Visit with us on tomorrow around 11.30. We're going to talk about hearing and change. But may you find peace on your journey. Thank you to our beloved friends. Thank you. Good night.